Okay, so if you remember, what we're doing here is slowly closing the box um, and developing some ideas that we need to talk about observations and to ask questions about how much we can learn from observations. When we're doing the dynamical systems, in a sense, we got to see the state space and see the trajectories, see the attractors, and that's sticking our head inside the box. Um, what we did last time was maybe the last um, point where we have our head inside the box because we were talking about how dynamical systems pushed probability distributions around, right? We shifted from starting from a single initial condition and tracing an orbit to starting with initial distribution and looking at how the dynamic pushed a distribution forward. And there was something new there, because now a distribution not only has states in its support, but attached to it, just like the Poincaré stretching, the pixels had colors attached to them and got pushed around. Now probably the distribution has states in the support, but probably amplitudes. And we had to worry about how those amplitudes got mapped forward. And that had everything to do with whether things were stretching or folding. So. Today, we're going to talk more directly about representing time. Last lecture was how distributions got moved forward, but at each moment in time, we were looking at a distribution over the state space. Now I want to talk about behaviors or sequences of behaviors. And we'll do it in a slightly simplified form today. Last time, we were talking about dynamical systems with probably distributions over continuous state spaces. And today, we're going to talk about processes over discrete state spaces. And then next lecture, we're going to bring these two things together. With this picture of an instrument providing a coarse grained representation of continuous internal states. So all three of these lectures sort of knit together into what I call sort of measurement theory. We need to know how probability slosh around in the dynamical system. Today we're going to talk about what happens if we had discrete precision, finite precision measurements and their probabilities and how we represent those. And then that kind of, the two lectures leave this question hanging out there. Well, how are these connected? And we do that with this technique called symbolic dynamics on Thursday. So then that will set us up to start talking about information. Um, a quick comment at the end of the lecture notes, there's some slides which I'm not going to cover in lecture and we won't use, but there's a technique that lets us calculate um, distributions on discrete state, discrete symbol models called Z-transform. So we can just ignore that for now. Um, I'm not sure that we'll use that directly. Um, it's a very useful calculational technique, but for our purposes now, maybe a little bit of a distraction. Okay. So we're marching along here, marching along the measurement channel. So like before, we're introducing actually a, a new <laughs> set of ideas. Um, depends on our remembering some of the probability theory we've introduced before. Uh, but now we want to talk about chains of random variables. Namely, looking at a system as it's unfolding over time and imagining we're measuring the system at a sequence of times. So typically, we'll think of this as uh, discrete time measurements. Um, we have a random variable at each time. And there'll be some shared alphabet for the random variable across the different times. And we'll assume, again, that mostly to help ourselves here, that the range of values each measurement can produce is discrete. In fact, I'm saying one up to k here. Mostly we're going to just look at binary processes. And one of the reasons we're doing this is I want to give you a picture, a, kind of a visual understanding of what the space of sequences looks like. And it helps to do that in a discrete alphabet case, discrete time, discrete alphabet setting. OK, uh, just like before with probability theory, capital letters mean random variable. Lowercase means a realization. So if this was a binary random variable, a realization would be heads or tails, 0, 1. So we'll talk about these by infinite chains of random variables. You should imagine we go infinite past, infinite future. And then we have words, which are realizations, actual 0, 1, or head-tail sequences. So we have this 
by infinite chain, and I'll denote that with the random variable symbol and this double arrow. And you typically think of this, we stop at some moment in time, and there's some past left arrow that's going to lead to some future right arrow. So just to lay it out here, typically when I say time t, when we're looking at the past, the random variables just go up to the random vari variable at time t minus 1, just convention. The future variable, s forward arrow at t, includes the random variable at time t and goes forward. So we take the bi-infinite sequence and break it into the two semi-infinite sequences, a past and a future. Um, more practically, we'll also be looking at blocks of over some period of time with these random variables. So here's the full notation of blocks of length L starting at time t. This is useful, for example, when we want to talk about if you actually had finite data, right? We're not going to have semi-infinite sequences of random variables or data for that matter. And then uh, it's a little bit of vocabulary. If I'm thinking about a particular L block set of random variables, it's realization. I'll refer to a word. The word heads, heads, tails, heads. So just a note again. Same notation except lowercase. Okay, so the thing we're going to study, the object of our interest, is what we're going to call a process. Now, the most general definition, in a sense, I was just talking about the raw sequence of behaviors, but they also occur with various probabilities. So a process is going to be this ungodly object. So with nothing else said, with minimal set of assumptions, we have this bi-infinite chain of random variables, infinite past, infinite future, and for each one of those, you assign a probability to it, which is a perfectly unworkable <laughs> representation of a process. And a lot of the goal we're pursuing is how we can come up with more compact descriptions of a process. So we'll talk about that today. Um, again, sort of practically, we can also talk about uh, sequence, typically I'll say word distributions, and that is the set of probability distributions over the L blocks. So this, this, this is a, a very big set here, right? And this is essentially an alternative way of specifying a process. I specify the probability of the length one words, the length two words, the length three words, the length four words, and so on, off to infinity. So that's, a, that's another way to specify a process. Also unwieldy, but there you have it. So think of this as the raw data. A lot of times I'll just give you a process. I'll specify it somehow, typically maybe in words, like a process that cannot generate consecutive zeros. And then we can ask what kinds of probabilities we can assign to the words there. And then try to see what possible models we can come up with for something like that. OK, so we have uh, these words of length L. Uh, we're going to say that a word is allowed or admissible. One finds either word used when the word has positive probability or inadmissible if it has zero probability. The example I just gave, the process that cannot generate two zeros in a row would have a length two word, zero, zero, that has zero probability. All the other length two words are admissible in that case. Um, now these distributions that we can put on top of, of words have certain consistency requirements, namely that the longer a word, typically the probability goes down. The probability of flipping two heads in a row for a fair coin is one quarter. If I ask what's the probability of seeing three heads in a row, that's one eighth. Right, so probabilities go down. In fact, more you know, directly, if, if I have the distribution over length L words, I can marginalize over the last symbol and get the probability of seeing the shorter word, or I can marginalize over the first symbol in the length L sequence and get that. Okay, so these are constraints on what these probability amplitudes are when I assign them to, to, to words. In addition, when I have a process, we say um, that if I've seen a given word, say 10 tosses of 
uh, fair coin. I've seen every subsequence. It's kind of a trivial thing, but mathematically, we say it's subword closed. That if I've seen some longer sequence, I've also seen every other sequence inside of it. In particular, those words are admissible. The words of length 1 and the length 10 sequence, the words of length 2, and so on. It, I mean, it's kind of obvious. And the reason we emphasize that is in computer science, there's a different notion of what are allowed words. You can have a word 1, 0 that, uh, say, 1, 0, 1, that's an allowed or accepted sequence in formal language theory. However, the word 1, 0 is not. So this is more of a physics setup where if I've seen a sequence, that means necessarily I saw all the measurements up to that sequence. So our processes are going to be subword closed. The probability distributions will have these consistency conditions on them and so on. Okay, well, so what kinds of stochastic processes are there? So what I want to do now is talk about just the processes. What behaviors or sequences occur and their probabilities. I'll give you a number of examples that we're going to keep coming back to probably at some point. Too often, they'll become too familiar. And then I'm going to shift, and this is just a little bit of a, a con conceptual change to shifting from behaviors and their probabilities, the process, to models of processes. And it's very often we think about processes in terms of their models, but actually it's two separate concepts. And we need to make that distinction because processes for us are going to be the theoretical stand-in for making observations. And we want to learn models, so they're not the same thing. If you're confronted with data, you don't necessarily have a model of it yet, and you'd like to learn that from the data. Or mathematically, I'll give you a process, and what is a good, compact, verbose representation of it. So we want to be able to ask those questions. So I don't want to confuse the notion of process and model, at least not too soon. Soon we'll move back and forth very quickly. Okay, so first kind of process that's often studied um, are stationary processes. And that's a pretty simple idea, namely that the word distribution, these probability amplitudes, don't depend on the time origin. So, and there are different uh, settings in which you would want to do that. Um, you, you don't want to worry about the process starting condition, or you imagine oh, the experiment in the lab has been running for a long time, you went out for coffee, you came back and it's still running. You know, all the equipment is stopped drifting around, everything's heated up, and the probability seeing one zero at the beginning of the experiment is the same as, as the probability seeing it an hour later. Okay? So, or we could imagine that we're doing many experiments and we assume that Again, if we see one zero in the first trial, that probability we measure will be the same as some, some later trial. So again, it just means that this is this distribution is essentially independent of time. So very often I'll just take t and assume it's zero. <coughs> and this should be true for, for every t. That it's equal to probability for the block at time zero. Um, we don't have to assume this, but it's very handy. It will kind of dominate the, the kinds of processes we're looking at. Again, it simplifies things. Uh, a lot of the ideas we'll talk about are become very interesting when we have non-stationary processes, or even the practical situation is if I have some data, you know, are the probabilities kind of drifting around because of experimental conditions or external perturbations I haven't taken into account or not? How do you test for stationarity? So all interesting questions. We're just going to assume it for now and see what the consequences are. One notational consequence is I'm pretty much just going to drop time indices. If I'm talking about, you know, the th length three word at, at hour 13, it, it doesn't matter because it could be the same length three word at the beginning of the experiment or four hours later. So I'll just drop t when it's convenient. I'll just be referring to length L blocks and length L words. It doesn't really matter when they occur. Okay. A uh, simple kind of stochastic process, stationary stochastic process, is the uniform process. So, easy to say in words, equal length sequences occur with the same probability. So, that's simple. I'll just denote that. If, if I want to write down the word distributions for it, I can do that very directly. The probability of words of length L is simply 1 over the alphabet size to the L. If I had a fair coin, heads and tails equal probability, I can write out exactly what the word distribution is for all lengths. It's just 1 over 2 to the L. If I'm looking at length 4 words in, in, in the fair coin, there are 16 of them, 2 to the 16, and they each occur with probability, I mean, 
2 to the 4, there are 16 of them, they each occur with probably 1 16th. Okay, so nice compact representation there. Um, actually quite helpful, it's a good reference point, sort of the, probably the most uninteresting process we'll look at, but there it is. Um, whenever we introduce new properties, the first thing you do is calculate it for this simple case. Now a little more sophisticated uh, class of process would be the independent identically distributed class. So what that means here is, okay, so independent, what's that mean? So I have this giant joint distribution over past and future, by infinite past and future, that means that it factors into this product of the distribution of individual symbols at different times. And that these individual random variable distributions are the same at any time. So independent and then identically distributed. And you will see this all over the place. Again, <laughs> these are Assumptions that are helpful because they give us simplifications we can work with when we have questions. Um, bias coin, we will come back and talk about this repeatedly, and you'll see there's some actually really puzzling things about this. But at first blush, we just imagine that the probability of heads is probably P, probably of tails is 1 minus P. I can, we can even write out in closed form exactly what the set of all the word distribution is, di distributions are. Just p to the n times 1 minus p to the l minus n, where n is the number of heads. Should be very familiar. So, nice closed form representation of the process for all l. Rarely do we get to do this, but there it is. Yeah? So, the uh, NIID process is stationary. Yes, NIID right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. From. Right, should be a little exercise. I mean, it's using some of the definitions, but yes, it's stationary. Another kind of process is what we call R block process. And what we mean here is this basically, the process just writes out blocks of length R. Okay, so to say it more formally, we take our giant joint distribution over the bi infinite random variables. And we have these blocks that are independent of each other, just like before. So it's one way to generalize an IID process to, to blocks. And we're really just making a distinction here between an alphabet and then these blocks. So a two-block process that can't generate consecutive zeros would be this one, so binary alphabet. Uh, probably zero, zero must be zero, and I just assign probabilities to uh, other uh, words, just one zero and, and one one have probability one. Call this the uh, noisy period two process, we'll come, come back to that. Right, so this process, as it's laying down these two blocks, will never generate consecutive zeros with the setting of the probabilities. That's why this one is zero two. Because if I wrote this one down and followed it, then I'd have two zeros following each other. So I set that one to zero. And again, what this means is if I had this length 6 sequence, the probability of this one breaks down into this product over length 2 blocks. Now probably one very large class you've heard of are the Markov processes. And what this means in the first case is this joint distribution factors into this telescoping product of one-step conditional distributions. Right, so it's a slight generalization. What it means is that the next measurement depends on the previous one. Measurement at t plus 1 depends on t, that at t plus 2 depends on t plus 1, and so on. Just one step dependence. You can see how it's a generalization from the IID process because there was no previous dependence. So it's a slightly more general type of thing. Um, here's another process that cannot generate two zeros in a row. Two zeros in a row. It's called the golden mean process. Um, this will be a good friend of ours after several lectures. Uh, again, binary alphabet. And then what I do to specify this are this sequence of four conditional probability distributions. Well, I can't generate two zeros in a row, so the probability of seeing a zero, if I saw, saw a zero before, is zero. And then I've assigned these probabilities, assuming the consistency conditions and so on. I have some 
choice uh, in these probabilities, but they also have to um, have satisfy those consistent, consistency conditions when you produce the, uh, the word distributions. So this is a slightly different process than the previous one. Um, they actually are, are similar up to length four. The golden mean process um, admits this sequence, which the previous one didn't. Um, Okay, uh, now, start kind of merging these things together here, uh, generalizing the Markov uh, process to having a dependence over the R previous variables. So what that means is that we think of that giant joint distribution over infinite past and future as broken into a series, a product of, of conditional distributions, just like for the one step one we just did, except that the dependence now just goes R steps back. In general, the, for a general process that could depend on the entire infinite past, but we're just going to just go R steps back. So, uh, wouldn't this be equivalent to a Markov process with different symbols? Or is that Yes, there, there, there are various ways of converting these back and forth, and we'll come to that. Right now, um, we're talking about processes. In a sense, when we start thinking about different ways of encoding them, we're getting closer to models. So we'll deal with that as soon as I shift from this kind of very raw description of a process in terms of probabilities over words or conditional probabilities over words. After a while, it gets a little tedious, and we just have to introduce some models. It simplifies the vocabulary. But it's sort of a related question is, how are these different um, classes of process related? So here's just a simple little demonstration that an order or a Markov process is more general than an R block process, right? So we, in some sense, both R block processes and order or Markov chains, they're telling us something about relevant time scales in a process, namely R time steps. Dependencies exist over our time steps. So if we just factor this uh, length four word, we get this just using usual uh, probabilities, probability identities. Yeah. When you say order R, is it always understood to be in order R Markov? Uh, I would probably mess up sometimes, but yes, that's generally what I mean. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then. Uh, Going back to the, the definition of conditional distributions, I just rewrite the two middle ones here as the ratio of a joint to the marginals. Okay. And then uh, rearrange things. And then you notice that I can end up with a two block process where the blocks are independent if this and this, namely this ratio, is equal to one. So if I assume this, namely that the joint distribution between the second and third random variable basically factors into its product, namely that those two random variables were independent, they're one here, then I'm sort of breaking the, the dependence here. So the, so, the, so the order R Markov process, the, the dependences are, you think of them as like a sliding window, whereas the blocks was just fixing. At the end of the block, there's no more statistical dependence end. So the order R Markov processes are more general. A wider range of processes that you can represent. So order a markup process than with block processes. Okay, so again, sort of like with our dynamic systems, that was us looking in the box and seeing the behaviors. Now I'm going to interpolate a measuring instrument here, and we'll talk about hidden markup processes, where we don't get a direct we don't get to know what the sort of internal state or symbol is that's given to us by a measuring instrument. So what I'm going to assume in this case is that we're going to have an order R Markov process, okay, that just length R uh, temporal dependence, and then this is but this is going to be observed through some instrument which I denote F here. There's some mapping from the bi-infinite hidden sequence to an observed sequence Y. There'll be a, a different alphabet now. We have to call that B. Um, we have this sort of measurement random variables, which itself is this bi-infinite chain. Um, the observation process, how we actually go from 
the S variable, internal variables to the observed ones is given by a conditional distribution. It's one way of thinking about what this F could be. Um, in fact, in this case, again, this F could be some stochastic function. It could add noise itself, not just be a direct mapping. And then we have sort of the situation of being an observer. Actually, all I have would be this process, this observed process over the Ys. And of course, practically working with block distributions over the observed sequences. So this is typically what we have to work with when we're doing experiments. And most of the questions, interesting questions we'll be dealing with will be how much and what <laughs> can we extract from Y that tells us about S, what, what S is, what these internal dependencies are. How much in this observation process is thrown away and how much is added, distorted. So I'll show you some, some examples of this today. Um, so here's another example prototype process that we'll work with a lot. It's called the even process. Uh, the names of these processes will become clear as we begin to analyze them a little more. The previous one I called golden mean, no consecutive zero. This is called the even process. Well, this might become a little bit clear here. Um, okay, so the internal process is going to be the golden mean process, right? So over, let's take a binary alphabet. So this is generating all binary sequences except no consecutive zeros. Um, if I see a one, I have to say something else to give it a complete specification. If I see a one, then I see a zero, one on the next time step with fair probability, turns out. Um, now, the observation process is going to have the uh, alphabet little a, little b, okay? And it's going to be a function of the output that I see, the symbol, AB symbol that I see, depends on the current internal binary variable and the previous one. So it's going to map from, so this F has a little bit of memory. It's going to map from the current and past variable, these two blocks, to a single symbol. And so here's the rule. If that two block, internal two block was a one one, I output an A. And if it was B, I mean, and, and if it was zero one or one zero, then I output a B. And since it's the golden mean process, I don't have to write down a rule for zero zero because that doesn't occur, that definition doesn't occur. Okay, so here's an example of this, how this F is working. So here's my sort of chain of a realization for the internal golden mean process. Notice all the zeros occur in isolation, so no consecutive zeros. And then I just go through and apply this rule. If I saw 1, 1, I output an A, 1, 0, B, 0, 1, B, 1, 1, A, 1, 1, A, and so on. Simple enough. So that seems nice and innocent. Did you see why it's called the, the even process? Two Bs, two Bs, four Bs, two Bs. There's more to say about this. Okay, so that's an example. And somehow this simple local measurement function maybe has done something interesting. The question is what is interesting about this? So we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, so, so that's just some example processes. We're just talking about words and their probabilities. And like I said, this gets a little bit tedious after a while. In fact, as I was trying to explain things, I was trying not to use the word model or in particular the word state, but this is really a natural way to think about processes, state-based models. So what I want to do here is sort of roll back and kind of work our way up through classes of representation of processes in terms of models. Okay. So the simplest is called the Markov chain. So we have a Markov process, and we're going to represent that with a model called a Markov chain. Uh, where the way we think about Markov chains is that they have some internal states. Well, these states are simply going to be the measurement alphabet, the observed alphabet there. Um, and we'll have some uh, internal state process over this, okay? By the chain of random variables, just, just to denote that V. And then now we have a dynamic that maps from one state to the next. And since it's a Markov uh, uh, process, this is going to be given by uh, a one-step conditional distribution. So probably the next state depends on the previous state you were in, okay? So we'll think of that as a, as a matrix that gives us transition probabilities going from state to state to state. Um, the transition matrix uh, 
every row uh, sums to one. So these are called stochastic matrices. Every row sums to one. And what that means is you always make a transition. Doesn't matter which one. They might occur with different probabilities, but you always make a transition. Um, and just like you were saying before, we can, if we wanted to, recast uh, an R block process, what we do as, as, as a Markov chain, what we can do is we'll just assume the blocks now are the states of the Markov chain. We just enrich our alphabet to be alphabet size to the R for the blocks. So now blocks become states, and they're these unitary things, and now we just think of them as states in this much larger transition matrix. Okay, so we can map back and forth. Probably depends on what your questions are in a given application, if you want to do one or the other. Um, now there's some more things we can say. We have these states, and uh, each moment in time we can ask, what's the probability of being in one of the k states? So that's a state distribution. I'll just think of that as a vector of numbers. Um, and we have this transition matrix, so we can use that to evolve a probability distribution forward. Should be certain echoes of what we were doing before, except this is much easier <laughs> to think about. So to just to point out here, mathematically, we have a choice. The way we're going to set this up, the way we're going to normalize the transition matrices, we multiply from the left. We take the state distribution, multiply it from the left against the transition matrix. So we take state probabilities, goes into the transition matrix, and we get the probability of each one of the states at the next time. We could have done right multiplication, but just out of habit, you have a choice. It's left multiplication. Uh, given that this is the one-step evolution of the probability, state probability distribution, we can just iterate this again and again to start from some initial distribution to get one at n steps later. And that, obviously, just by induction, is just I can do that in a sense one step if I had the transition matrix to the nth power. So again, we have a, a state sequence. We might want to know, if I have a particular length L state sequence, what's its probability? And that just is, again, because it's Markov process, just given by this telescoping chain of conditional transition probabilities, prepended with the probability of which state we start in. So that's just factoring this joint distribution out this way, and assuming the one-step Markov, order one Markov property. This is typically what they look like. If we had three internal states, we'd have a three by three matrix giving the transition probabilities from B to B or C to B and so on. Uh, they're all normalized. The T being stochastic means these equalities here. And then graphically, and we'll use a lot of graphical representations of these state-based models. We have three states here. Those are the circles. We have arrows connecting them. And then the arrows are labeled with transition probabilities. So you can either look, <laughs> think of it this way or you can think of it this way. Um, you'll see after a while, this way is deeply uninformative, <laughs> even though that's how we represent it in code and calculate things. Um, we'll get comfortable with these label-directed graph representations of Markov chains. Uh, and you can sometimes pull out properties pretty quickly just by inspecting, by visual inspection. Um, and this is going to help us be more explicit about when we talk about how processes are structured. Um, in the general case, there are different kinds of states for, uh, for a Markov uh, chain. Um, and we'll need to distinguish these things. So uh, here's one of these you know, label-directed, I should say, yeah, label-directed graphs. Uh, we've got six states here. Um, there's a certain kind of architecture to this that we'll, we'll end up being very interested in. Um, so. Uh, there are states like A, B, and C, such that if you rattle around in them for a while, you'll eventually transition out of and never return. Those are called transient states. So here, if I had you know, transition probabilities, there'll be some probability that I'll eventually transition to B. I'm never going back to A, so it's relatively transient. I might have this kind of A, B, C, B, C, B, C thing, but eventually, if there's some positive probability, I'll leak out here down to the set of D, E, and F and never go back to A, B, and C. So those are called transient states, and then there can be a set of states called the recurrent states that you rattle around in for a long period of time. I can even make this more elaborate, have several recurrent components, and so on. So that's our first kind of graphical hint that the structure of the, in the transition matrix can be uh, useful to us. Um, we can also sometimes specify a start state. I'm going to start in state A with probability 1. I can have several start states and say I'm going to start state A in state uh, H with probability 50-50. 
Another sort of architectural uh, observation is that you can have subsets of states that are strongly connected. That means you can get within a strongly connected set, every state can get to every other state. So B can't get to C, but A can get to itself. B and C can get to each other, so that's a strongly connected component. And then the way I've drawn the recurrent set, these are all strongly connected. D, E, and F can all get to each other eventually. So the graphical representation of these models is helpful. We want to start talking about how they're structured. There's a little more we can do. Um, you might be interested in it as the model or process is operating for a long time in what state distribution we have at long times or asymptotically. So it's often denoted in pi. And as we sort of noted before, if I specify an initial distribution over the states, I can push that forward with t to the n. So this is really the uh, uh, asymptotic state distribution is really just a property of powers of the uh, transition matrix. In fact, the way you calculate it is you look at this, we're looking for a vector pi, this vector over state probability such that when it gets multiplied into t, it comes back to itself. Right? It's a fixed point distribution like we were talking about before with dynamical systems. So th this, in linear algebra language, we're looking for an eigenvector and it's associated with an eigenvalue of one. This is called the principal eigenvalue. It's one for a stochastic matrix like these transition matrices. And then we look at a vector that will satisfy that. Um, this uh, sort of eigenvalue equation doesn't uh, specify the asymptotic, asymptotic um, state probabilities completely, but we, and we assume normalization. So it's an additional condition of the family of distributions that can satisfy this. We pick the one that is normalized. And now, this one maybe small question we could ask. If we've been looking at a process for a long period of time, and we come in and we observe a particular sequence, state sequence, what's its probability? Well, now we can assume that we're starting in the first sequence. Before it was arbitrary, it's just p of v0. Now we can assume, if it's been running for a long time, that we're in state v0 with this asymptotic state probability. And that then lets us calculate sort of long-term probability of seeing a particular length L sequence for a Markov chain. So some examples. Uh, fair coin again. So I can either write down, if I have sort of two states, heads and tails, I have a two by two matrix. If it's fair, then the transition from heads back to itself or to tails is equal probability. Same thing going from tails back to heads or tails. Um, I can write out the, the label directed graph. So I have two states, heads and tails, and then the edges, all, all edges are there and they all have the same probability. Um, go calculate the, this eigenvector normalizing probability. It's 50-50. No surprise. It's going to degenerate here. Um, right, and we conclude that probably probably heads and tails is a half. Um, you could also imagine that we had a much larger alphabet and you can uh, sort of now picture what that looks like, right? It has as many states as there are symbols in the alphabet and then as many transitions as there are symbols in the alphabet. Um, right, all states can get to all states. Okay, so now what I want to do is to shift over, using the examples, the processes and the models um, I've introduced, to start talking about um, what the space of sequences looks like for these different cases. Okay, so what we're going to do is start with the fair coin. And again, we can write down exactly what the distribution, the word distributions should be for any length. So that's, there's no mystery here. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is, and we kind of talked about this a little bit when I, um, uh, introduced um, cellular automata. What, what, so, so in order, we want to look at the space of all sequences generated by the, the fair coin. So what I'm going to do is take each word of length one, of length two, of length three, and stick a binary point in front of it, and then interpret it as a number on the unit interval. Okay. So in some sense, I'm metrizing it. Every word here is going to be the the, the bits will be weighted by some power of one half. Right. So if I have one one, then I have 
uh, the first thing would be weighted by half, the next uh, uh, digit would be weighted by a quarter, and so on. And then when I do that, so what I'm going to do here, th this is a mosaic of word distributions, the length one words, length two words, all the way up to length nine words. Um, I did not write down this boring constant function. What I did here is actually just generate, kind of flip coins, and calculate empirically. So there's, a, there's some noise here which has to do with finite sample noise. Okay, so here, at length equal one, uh, oh, I should say, the, the vertical axis is again log base two of the probability. So words of length one, well, we just have heads and tails, and they occur with equal probability. So at least empirically, that sample had almost exactly the same number of heads and tails. Now, what I've done here is there are only two words. So you should think of this like a histogram. On the unit interval, I've drawn uh, uh, the probability of zero as this bar here, and probability of one as this bar here. Okay. Now, when I go to length two, there are four words, right? Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and one, one. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. I now have four bins, and I'm putting the probability above each one of those bins, but it's also uniform here, other than these little kind of statistical estimation uh, errors. Uh, length three, we have eight words going from three zeros up to three ones, and I'm laying them across in sort of increasing order, sometimes called lexicographic order, or it's just numerical order if there are these binary fractions, and so on. Length four, 16 words, length five, 32, 64 words, until I get to length nine, 512 words. So, and you can see, it's not really the point of these slides, but you do see that, that the statistical variations are increasing because I have, I'm trying to estimate the probability of 512 events here, and I have fewer counts of those than just counting heads and tails in the same sequence. So, my estimate of the probability amplitude, which should be exactly flat, is modulated. Again, if I took enough samples, it would converge. In fact, the, the, the fluctuations here go, go down as 1 over the, 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 the data length, 1 over the square root of the data length. Okay, so that's just mostly to introduce this mosaic of word distributions to get some sense. Nothing surprising here. Um, bias coin. Okay, so you can write down the transition matrix, probability of uh, heads going to itself, probability of heads going to tails, and so on. Or this graphical model, which again, I find much easier to read. You can go calculate this asymptotic invariant distribution, pi, and it's p and 1 minus p. Again, no surprise. Probably the heads is p, tails 1 minus p. Um, uh, the bias coin is nice because it also gives us a picture of what all of these IID processes look like, especially when we think in terms of these graphical models here. The Markov chain has as many states as there are symbols. And then uh, the trans transition leave each state and go to all states, right? So it's sort of like the, uh, the, the generalization to the uniform process over more symbols. Um, one interesting thing is that you can say that the previous model doesn't show is that the transitions entering state I have the same probability as the state. So notice, so the probability of, of, of heads is P, and notice that the transition probabilities coming into state H, R, P also. So very highly constrained. These IID processes are very, very highly constrained. Very easy to read properties off of them, if you will. Okay, now for something fun with the word distribution mosaic. Again, so bias coin, and I can write out in closed form what the word distribution is for any length. Okay, so here, um, right, it's just probability of heads to the number of heads in the sequence times the probability of tails to L minus the number of heads in the sequence. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is, is, is simulation run, again, where I have um, probability of heads is 60%, probability of tails is 40%. And so, of course, when I look here at length one words, that's just the probability of heads and tails, we, we see a difference. Okay, uh, we go now to length two, we have four sequences again. So tails, 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 heads, heads, tails, and heads, heads, or say in terms of zeros and ones, and we see there these steps now appearing. Of course, the most probable sequence would be two heads in a row, 60% times 60%. Um, these two middle sequences, uh, tails, heads, and heads, tails, well, it doesn't matter which way I multiply the probabilities. 
40% times 60% or 60% times 40%. We get the same probability amplitude. And then, of course, the least probable sequence is tails, tails. So now I'd like to just say, and so on, right? We go now to link three sequences, three tails in a row, three heads in a row, still the most probable, still the least probable. But now we're starting to get some funny structure in there. And I'll just let your eye kind of sweep over this, like four, like five, like six. You start to see there's a really complicated set of probability amplitudes. All the words occur, right? They're all admissible. They all have positive probability. But what we're seeing is that the distribution of the words is getting really complicated until finally, well, actually we get down to where statistical fluctuations, but you see it gets more and more refined. This is just a biased coin. And here we are, we're just trying to get some sense, in particular, in the, you know, the limit of infinite like sequence. What's the distribution? That was easy to do in the case of the fair coin, because it was just flat. So you kind of understood what the infinite sequence probability space looked like. Just with the bias coin, suddenly there's something completely non-trivial occurring. We're getting this almost fractally, well it is, it turns out, fractally distribution of probability amplitudes, and it gets more and more refined as we go to infinite like sequences. Yeah. So if you make the x-axis like a great question, do you still see that, or do you, does it become more common? It becomes, yeah, you, you, you can, right. Um, in some sense, the, the, the self-similar structure here depends on the particular way I've metrized the space of sequences. I could sort them from most probable to least probable, and then, then there are other sort of um, conclusions you can sort of draw for the bias coin about the distribution of amplitudes, probability amplitudes. Uh, but, but this is, uh, despite that, this is still a nice indication of, of how, even though this process is very simple, just to buy his coin, there is this diversity, independent of how I plot, there is this diversity suddenly created in the probability amplitudes. And there becomes this question, how do we start describing it? This is one of the things we're going to have to uh, deal with. Not only which behaviors occur and don't occur, but also complications in the distribution of probability amplitudes. It seems like there's a, like a definite structure in the six and seven one, but then in the nine one, it starts to get washed out. It's actually just a function of the points. Yeah, yeah. I should have taken a, a longer sample length, and then it would. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, the self similarity. If you kind of imagine, take this half, expand it out. It's exactly that half with the right rescaling. So, however you plot it, whatever your choice of metrizing is, it's going to have that self similarity. Well. The fair coin had it too, but it was trivial. It was just a flat distribution going to a flat distribution. This is interesting because of this real diversity. In fact, that there are an infinite number of different probability amplitudes when L goes to infinity. So how are you going to deal with it? Typically, the way you deal with it is you say, oh, that these actual probability amplitudes are randomly distributed and they have a Gaussian distribution. And there's a mean value and a distribution about that. But, Okay, so this is just the kind of a first hint that things get complicated. When we're trying to describe behaviors, sequences, um, we'd like to understand what the structure of that space is, and this is the first hint that it's complicated. At least in terms of probability amplitudes. Okay, well, maybe something simpler. <laughs> Another example, periodic process. So A, B, C states with probability 1, I go A, B to C to A, and so on. And then we just have T is now just a permutation matrix. There's just, each row just has a single um, transition probability. The only curious thing here, and this is the reason I pointed out, is that if you wanted to calculate pi using that eigenvalue equation, right, left multiplying, looking to see if it comes back to itself, Maybe it's best to kind of explain this on this graph. I can put any initial distribution down on here. Under one step, it'll come back to itself. I can go a quarter, quarter and a half, quarter, quarter, and after three steps, it comes back to itself. So who's to say it's invariant? So you actually have to be careful in this trivial, what would behaviorally be a trivial case, periodic. You actually have to be careful how you calculate this pi from the eigenvalue equation. I can put any distribution here, and it'll be invariant. So we'll come back and solve this little problem uh, in a different way uh, later on. There's a natural way to ask about how distributions relax down onto the asymptotic distribution. So <coughs> sequence distribution here is really simple. Um, I, I, is that just looking for higher period orbits? Right, because this was, this, this, 
invariant distribution. On that. Under one step, right, exactly. Step. Yes, right. Two steps or three steps. Uh, yes. Well, OK, so, right. So the point I'm making is let's think about doing it three steps. Every initial distribution is invariant under three steps. Right. Right. Point one, point one, point eight. One over pi, one over pi, two, anyway, goes on, you know, it's everything under three that steps. Not yeah, it turns out that it, it's so degenerate that the standard ways of calculating it don't work. Yeah. So most of the way, when you have nice, what's called mixing properties, you actually have the, in, these initial distribution being spread out, in other words, kind of the discrete analog of chaos. <laughs> then the standard eigenvalue analysis techniques, looking for the eigenvector work fine, but in these periodic cases, or if you have a little bit of noise, a little bit of um, um, kind of branching in this, and an overall periodic component. Imagine you had three biased coins hopping between each other periodically. Same issue comes up, so it, it causes yeah. But we're we're actually going to like that sort of thing. Um, uh, the other sort of obvious uh, uh, you know exercise here is just you can show that you know in terms of the state distribution sequence over states. Um, basically, um, you know, for long words, there are only three words that occur of basically any length, and they all occur with probably one third. Right? Certainly, the states themselves have probably one third. The probability of seeing pairs is also one third. The length three words also have probably one, length four. The only three length four words, three length five words, and they all have probably one third. So. Okay, simple enough. So a model of this golden mean process, right? So before it was just defined as don't generate consecutive zeros. So here is how we represent this as a state-based model. The states now are going to be these length two words. Zero, zero doesn't occur because that can't be produced by the process. Um, you actually have to, it takes a little while to sort of work out the transition matrix here, um, how one zero transitions, one zero transitions to one one, and so on. It takes a little while. I've drawn that out explicitly. Uh, you'll notice that there is a restriction. I can't go from uh, uh, one zero to zero one because that would put two zeros next to each other. So there's an edge down here that's missing from the complete all transitions three state label directed graph I gave you before. So there's an edge here. I can go the other way, but not back this way. And that affects all the other probabilities. Um, these blocks, just by doing the calculations I mentioned, you can show that they occur with equal probability. Um, no. Here's another model of the golden mean process, no consecutive zeros that uses only two states. So here, what I'm going to do is just take the alphabet now, just the binary alphabet, and take those as my states. And what this, this model is showing you is that if I see a 0, I must see a 1. If I've seen a 1, I can see a 1 or a 0 with fair probability. But if I see a 0, I must see a 1. So it's a perfectly valid, obviously easier to interpret than the previous one. <laughs> uh, simpler two by two matrix. Um, and now we have these different states, right? So you have to go calculate this so-called left eigenvector, normalize and probability, and find out that the sequence that's produced by the golden mean process, ones occur with probability two thirds, and zeros occur with probability one third. That's an interesting con conclusion. Um, this is now an order one Markov chain, uh, and it's sort of a minimal order, minimal size. We'll talk about smallest models. That's going to be an important property later on as we start building models. First observation is that I specified the process, and I gave you two models. So this gets back to the main point I was trying to, to, to start out with. We don't want to confuse models with processes. Processes are what occurred, and we have different representations. Actually, the, in the language of the field, we call these different presentations. So the two different models, this two-state model and the three-state model, are two different presentations of the golden mean process. So 
sometimes that's a good thing to have different models. Sometimes certain properties are easier to calculate or just easier to work with. Trying to find transformations from one kind of model class to another can be very helpful, especially with simplified calculations. Oop, sorry. So the golden mean is also a nice uh, example of combination of things. Namely, we already saw with the bias coin there, as we go to long sequences, the distributions over the words get really complicated and have that self-similar structure. Now we also have a restriction. Certain sequences don't occur, those with two zeros in a row. Okay, so let's kind of talk through the, the word distribution mosaic and see if we can see those things. Well, okay, length one, well, zeros and ones do occur. And I just told you with that second model, Ones occur with probably two-thirds, zeros occur with probably one-third. Now we go to length two, and what happens? Well, the first thing is that zero, zero doesn't occur. So we see our first restriction here, and just coincidentally, the three other words, <coughs> zero, one, one, zero, one, one, occur with probably one-third. Now we go to length three, and what's, what's happened here? Well, three zeros in a row, two zeros and a one, and one and two zeros all have two zeros in them, therefore they're forbidden. So due to this no consecutive zeros restriction, there's a consequence at longer words. It cleaves out the admissible sequences. In addition, of course, there's some interesting things going on with the probability amplitudes too. Length four, well, I won't go through it in detail here, but all of these gaps here are words that at least contain two zeros in a row length five, length six, and so on. So now, kind of letting your eyes sweep over this, you kind of imagine this single restriction causes a cascade of restrictions and precludes longer words from occurring. In fact, the way they occur, so now we're excluding things in the support of the word distribution, the sequences, the way they occur is self-similar. You can kind of imagine, uh, let's see, it, nah, not too obvious. Well, roughly speaking, this guy looks like this guy, this guy looks like that guy. It's a little more complicated to, to draw by eye what this looks like. And it keeps getting more and more refined. And in fact, the gaps sort of start taking up more and more of the space. This might remind you just a little bit you know, visually of the, of, the, uh, of the dissipative Baker's map. And there's even a notion of fractal dimension we could calculate the fractal dimension. But we're going to come back and reintroduce that idea with information theory. It turns out it's related to something called the, the entropy rate of the process. How many sequences occur um, as L goes to infinity. Overall, what's going on? There are two things here, right? First, well, we already talked about with the bias coin. There's sort of complicated things happening with the probability amplitudes. That structure we'd like to capture. And now, the support of the distribution is becoming complicated. Every time there's a restriction, there's a cascade, there's a set called the Cantor set that's precluded at infinite length, the self-similar set. So there are really two lessons here. We can have structure in the behaviors, namely the support of the distribution, which words do and do not occur, and also in the set of probability amplitudes. And there's a very practical question. If you were trying to build a model, and you see or don't see sequences, you're making some estimate of the probabilities, is what you're seeing due to structure in the distribution, low probability events, or you, just, you don't actually see something. So anytime we're doing estimation, we're sort of mixing these two things. And I tried to draw it with the, the word distribution mosaics very clearly. I mean, we know what the processes are, so we know what's exactly going on. We can see how these things can interact. Um, and these structures do, two different kinds of structure do play, get coupled together whenever we're doing some kind of statistical estimation. Okay, so these were just Markov chain models of Markov processes. The real thing we're interested in is taking into account measurement distortion. So. Now I want to talk about hidden Markov models of processes generally. So like the hidden process we talked about before, there'll be some internal states. But now I'm going to think of this as some kind of Markov chain. So it actually has states, not just raw sequences over symbols. 
So internal states in some alphabet, and then there's an internal state process given by a transition matrix. So that's just a Markov chain. And now we have uh, the observation process. So what we're, the way we're going to represent this is we're now, in a sense, take the state-to-state -state distribution matrix and kind of split it into those transitions that emit this or that symbol that generate an A or a B, say. So instead of these sort of one-step state-to-state conditional distributions, given that I'm starting in state V, there's going to be some distribution over what state I go to and then what symbol I'm going to emit or see. And if we do that, then we can recover the internal state transitions by basically summing out the observed symbol, so we easily recover this. And uh, just like the internal Markov chain matrix is a stochastic matrix, all rows sum to one, there's also a normalization condition for, for these sort of measurement symbol label transition matrices, the TSIJs. Before, we had an internal state distribution. We knew how to calculate that using powers of the matrix or doing the eigenvalue analysis to get the asymptotic state distribution. Fine. Uh, you know, the state sequences, we can now calculate exactly their asymptotic probability because we know the asymptotic state visitation probability, so we can write out those telescoping products exactly. But now we've got observed sequences on top of this. Okay, so now we're seeing sequences or words over a different alphabet through some function. And a simple question that we ask in every case is, what's the probability of a sequence? Well, before, when we were just looking at Markov chains or looking at the internal Markov chain, we got to write out this explicit telescoping chain because we got to see the state values. Okay, now if I see, if, if this was, a, say, a binary alphabet, and now I'm looking at strings that are being produced over A's and B's, I might have a particular A-B sequence, B, A, B, B, A. And what I have to do now, notice the sum here, I have to calculate out, starting in all possible states, sequences of state transitions that would produce that observed sequence. In other words, it, for, for a given observed sequence, there could be many internal state sequences that could produce it. I'll give you some examples here, but that, this is the main difference here. So now, suddenly, up here, we had this sort of one-to-one -one mapping, if you will, <laughs> mostly because we get to look at the states. We no longer have that between the internal sequences and the observed sequences. And this is gonna, it's another challenge for trying to figure out what's going on internally. So multiple state sequences can produce the same observed sequence. There's a degeneracy there, and the question is, if I just have observed data, how can I ever figure out what the possible multiplicity of internal states is. I mean, surprisingly, there's going to be a positive answer to that, but it's going to take a while to get there. First, let me just kind of finish um, introducing the hidden Markov chain or model class. Um, again, the internal thing, just like before, right? You have three internal states, all possible transition probabilities are labeled here. Now we have an observed, say, binary alphabet. Um, and we now label the transitions with the sequence that gets observed and the state-to-state -state transition probability. We have those pairs there. <clears throat> and now we have, we kind of separated out T into two different matrices, T0 and T1, with these refined transition probabilities that also give us the probability of seeing a symbol. Yeah? Is it, is it always the fact that you're, you code what you observe on a transition, or is it what ah. you observe in the state? Right. So actually, uh, if you go to a lot of the literature and textbooks, what you're going to see for hidden Markov models, where they put the observed symbol on a state. So I come into state A and I emit a zero or a one with, say, some bias coin probability, something like that. That's overwhelmingly the model that's used. So it's a little bit of a, a kind of a heads up or even telling you part of the punchline. It's extremely important for us when we talk about building models and giving this positive answer I just referred to, to disambiguate states from observations. Right? So the contrast I've been trying to draw here is when we had just a Markov chain and I saw ABC, 
in a sense, I had my head inside the box. But now when that process is hidden and it's generating zeros and ones, I don't want to confuse the zeros and ones with states. And so what I do is we put the, the symbols on the edges and not with the states. We're going to come back to this property again and again and again. It's but very helpful eventually. Uh, it even has very quantitative uh, uh, impact when we use uh, information theory to measure how much um, uncertainty there is in sequences. We want to disambiguate that from the amount of state information the process is using. So it's sometimes I pass through this, no one notices, but but. Uh, and there's a, maybe a little difference in trying, if you go read another standard book on Markov chains, hidden Markov models, it's like, what, what's the difference here? They're all, okay, both edge-labeled and state-labeled hidden Markov models describe the same class of processes, and there's a way to interconvert between them. So, so there's no loss of generality here, but in fact, there's a lot of um, clarity we get from doing this, and some kind of new ideas about um, state complexity of processes. In fact, here's, in, in a sense, kind of the first, first uh, kind of consequence of this choice. Um, so, as I said, there, there are different types of hidden Markov model. State labeled, we're, we're looking at edge labeled, and we can think of edges, you know, starting state, ending state, and the symbol emitted um, as an event, and it has an associated probability. Um, now, there's a class of these edge labeled hidden Markov models that we're very interested in. And these are called unifeeler hidden Markov models. And what unifeeler means is uh, that if I know the state and the symbol, I, un I go to a un unique next state. So graphically, here we go. So, so if I'm in state A, and I know that I saw a zero, I know I'm going to C. A, and I see a one, I know I'm in B. Um, this is a little bit uh, kind of a funny case. Independent of seeing a zero one, I'm going to go to B. That's okay. That still fits in with this. Um, and then the unifilarity has a certain um, constraint. puts a certain constraint on these these symbol uh, labeled transitions. Namely, again, kind of restating what I said here. If I know the state and the symbol, then the state I go to. I go there with probability one. Or the other way to say it is if I know the state, then the, my uncertainty over the next state and the symbol is the same thing as the uncertainty in the symbol I'm going to see. Um, yeah. So, and actually, so, and those people that have um, studied some formal language and automata theory, unifeeler is the, is the vocabulary from, from information theory. If you studied automata, these are deterministic automata. So, um, the use of the word deterministic here is this interesting collision, vocabulary collision between two fields. What is meant in automata theory is if I'm a little machine like this, finite set of states like this, and I'm reading data in, as I'm reading the data in, it's the data, zeros and ones off the tape, is telling me which state to go to uniquely. That's all it means. For us, it has a different set of there are consequences, but it's, 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 it's similar there. Unifeeler means that there's, if I'm looking at, if I'm reading a binary sequence, I follow a unique state path. So think filament. <laughs> it's a sense of unifeeler. Or if I generated the sequence, there's a mapping, not too complicated a mapping, between the state sequence and the sequence generated. So this is actually letting us deal a little bit with this ambiguity that I introduced just before between I'm observing a symbol and the possible many, many, many internal state sequences that could have produced it. Unifilarity constrains that. And I'll give some examples. Just to be, make a drive the point home, of course, there are these other things, kind of unconstrained, non unifilar that don't have that property. So, and, then, and all we need is just one violation anywhere in a state-based hidden model like this, so that if I'm in state A and I see a 1, I don't know what state I go to. There's some uncertainty in that. And you can see, as an observer, this is not good, right? If you have a model that has this, suddenly, and then you measure a 1, your ambiguity, your knowledge about the internal state distribution just got worse, right? So this is going to be, non unifilarity is going to be one way in which that sort of observation function can throw inf important information away. In many cases, it's recoverable. So, 
Right, so non-unifilarity leads to this multiple edge paths or state sequences leading to um, a single observed sequence. So I'll give some examples of this, not just talk about the general case. Um, but first, kind of go back through these different processes and see what they look like in terms of unifilar hidden Markov models. Fair coin. Well, a fair coin, we can represent that with a single state. And now the observed symbols are heads and tails, so I put those on the edges, and then I have transition probabilities of 50-50. So there's a little hint of where we're going with this. Is Notice this is a very, an even simpler model. Before, when I had a Markov chain model of the fair coin, I had two states called heads and tails. And I was kind of confusing the observations, heads and tails, with having some kind of state memory. I'm either here or here. But in fact, the fair coin has no dependencies between them. You know, the coin flips are independent. So here we have a simpler model. There's a single state. We have to think about what a state means here. And then it can, from that state, I can generate either heads or tails with fair probability. You know, the transition matrix is kind of trivial here, just one. So one by one matrix. Uh, the, the, the symbol labeled transition matrices are also one by one matrices, but now they have components a half a half, which of course, if I sum them back up, I get the, the internal state transition. Um, yeah. Uh, bias coin as a unifilar hidden Markov model. I can also do it with a single state. Oh, and I guess I forgot to point out why is this unifilar? Same argument is for the fair coin. If I know the state I'm in, and I know what the symbol is, I know what state I'm going to. Kind of trivial observation. Um, but, but now the bias coin is, in this presentation, very simple. It also has just a single state, which is, turns out having a single state is reflecting the fact that it's an IID process. So IID processes in this have just single states. They're kind of structurally trivial processes, the whole class of IID processes. Is, so that's another benefit we get to labeling the edges with the symbols. <coughs> Okay, uh, Golden Mean Process as a hidden Markov model in the unifilar presentation. So here's, here's how we do it. We have uh, two states, A and B. It's almost easier for me to describe the, the, the label directed graph. Two states, A and B. If, I see, if I'm in A and I see a zero, I go to B. But if I'm in B, I see a one with probability one. Whenever I'm in A, it basically is a fair coin flip for a zero and one. On a one, I go back to A. On a zero, I go to B. Now, uh, so this is you know a, a two-state presentation of that, um, and here's the sort of uh, one way of labeling that, which I just described. I have this output binary alphabet, and I split the the state-to-state -state transition matrix into these two pieces. So there's only one transition on a zero. So this T zero matrix just has this one half probability corresponds to this right here. And then both B and A go back to A, B on probability one and A on probability half. So um, now we can ask this question, if I'm looking at zero, one sequences, what do I know about the internal states? Okay, so there's just a little bit of ambiguity in the output sequence. In particular, it depends on where you start. So the, the mapping from internal state sequences to observe sequences over the binary alphabet, is, is, it's a two to one mapping. And you can see this here. So imagine that I've seen a series of ones. I've observed that. Well, either I could have started in B and produced, say, you know, one and then four ones, or started in A and just produced five ones. So we just have, a, kind of at the initial time, a little bit of ambiguity, kind of finite ambiguity in terms of uh, the output sequence. Well, that's not, that's not too bad. So, um, um, the other thing about this um, presentation of the golden mean process is that uh, one question we're interested in is an observer. If, if I know this model and, and then I come into the lab and I've kind of forgotten what's going on, um, I want to know what the internal state is. So, notice in the golden mean uh, presentation here, if I see a zero, I know immediately that the process is in state B. And if I see a one, I know it's in state A. So we say that the observer is synchronized. 
So imagine we have some big, you know, multi-state process. You're observing this very impoverished zero-one string, and you want to know how much information I need to observe the information I need to determine uniquely what the internal state is. This case is very simple. In one step, I know exactly what the internal state is. Well, let's compare the internal state sequences with the observed sequences here. So we have A, B's, internal state sequences, and I metrized it using A as 1, B as 0. Um, and it's the golden mean process that we saw before. It's an internal Markov chain, just the golden mean. Now, the observed sequences, turns out, they're exactly the same. Well, that was the claim that, that rather than using this observed Markov chain, we used a hidden Markov unifilar presentation of it. And the output word distribution looks just like the, the internal state sequence distribution. So the information is preserved. The internal state information is preserved in the observed sequences. Now, this is kind of a simple case here. You could, you could have concluded this from the previous discussion, previous slide, but this is actually sort of a calibration for some interesting things that will now happen. So let's look at the even process as if it was a hidden Markov model, and we'll give a unifilar presentation of that. Uh, so we're going to have two internal states here. Uh, again, it's unifilar. A goes to A on just a zero. A goes to B on a one. And B, I must go to A on a 1 with probability 1. Um, so the internal structure here, if I just drop the observed symbols, is just the golden mean process. Right? It's, this is the no consecutive Bs process internally. And with all the you know, golden mean prop, probabilistic properties. You're in state A with probably 2 thirds, state B with probably a third. But now we have this observation process you split the, the internal state matrix into these two here. Right, there's only one uh, transition on a zero back to A. So we just have that one entry here. And then T1, A goes to B with probably a half, and then B goes to A, B goes to A with probability one. So let's go through this again. Compare the internal state sequence. And it, here's one realization. And then. Uh, you can just follow this through here. So A goes to A on a 0, A goes to B on a 1, B goes to A on a 1, A goes to A on a 0, and so on, and just write out the sequence. And what you notice is that the output binary sequence has this property I alluded to before, namely that whenever 1s occur, they occur in a block of even number bounded by zeros. So that should strike you as slightly odd. Why? Because the internal process was just the golden mean. It has like a one-step restriction. Don't produce two zeros in a row. End of story. That, completely, that verbal description completely characterizes the golden mean process. And here, we have an output sequence, which actually has a property that can extend over an arbitrarily long block of ones. Hence, even this. So, so the output sequences sort of look like this. Zero, block of ones of even number, zero. So somehow, this even process, and it's being made more explicit when we write down this unifilar hidden Markov model presentation of it, uh, has an infinite range kind of memory. It can't put a, you know, an odd number of ones there. It can't do that. Even if it's seen you know, a million ones in a row, it's going to put in, when it puts the, finally puts the, the, uh, the one down, so we have an even number, then it can put down a zero, but not before. So this is curious, very curious. Um, before, with the golden mean, I could describe the structure in the support as you went to longer and longer words by just saying, oh, it's just cleaving out all those words with two zeros. So that's called its list of irreducible forbidden words. There's one word, don't produce two zeros in a row, end of story. The even process has a countable infinity of these irreducible forbidden words. At length three, I see zero, one, zero. That's an odd number, not allowed. And as soon as I see that, 
there'll be a cascade through longer words that have this little length three subword, and those will all be inadmissible. Those will all be cleaved out. But then, as soon as I start looking at length five words, there's a new forbidden word. Right, zero, three, one's in a zero. Right, this word isn't forbidden by this one. No, that's fine, it's new. And then this word, as soon as it occurs, it also has this cascading effect of cleaving out longer and longer words that contain it as a subword, and so on. So this is the strange thing about the, 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 the uh, even process. The most dramatic way to state this is that there's no finite order Markov process that can be that can model the even process, or I should I should say, no finite order Markov chain can model the even process because of this property. So and one conclusion is that finite Markov chains are a subset of hidden Markov models. So as soon as I start looking at what classes of processes hidden Markov models can represent, suddenly there's a much wider class of processes that can be finitely presented. And this has you know, the sort of observable consequences. So here is, again, the sort of internal state sequence words. Well, we know what this is. This is the golden mean, right? No two zeros, three zeros, two zeros and one, one zero and so on. I'll preclude. So that's what the inter internal state process is. But now we look at the output, which is the even process. Um, and we see that all the words of length one occur, all the words of length two occur, and finally, at length three, we see zero, one, zero being precluded. And now you have to kind of imagine along with me, just like the argument I made before, that zero, zero is cascaded through all the way to infant sequence, precluding their own cantor set of forbidden words. That single word has partial responsibility for the structure of the, sub of the support of the distribution of longer words. And then, uh, and then these words here, you have to... Well, you can look at the, the notes and convince yourself that the length four words that are forbidden all come from having zero, one, zero in them. Then at length five, up here somewhere, there's zero, three ones, and a zero, along with other words that are precluded by this one. But then now we have this new uh, uh, length five forbidden word, and it cascades down and causes another Cantor subset of support to be precluded. These are just two state processes. <laughs> We have a countable infinity of, of these Cantor sets, self-similar sets that are precluded. And, you know, goes without saying, complicated probability amplitudes. Why is that of concern to us? Because if I just gave you sequence data, this is what you're going to be working with. And the question is, how do I go from this data that I've given you with all these kind of competing kinds of complication, a potential structure, how do I go from the data back to, oh, it's a two-state model that's unifield hidden Markov. So that's spring. I will give you a positive answer in spring. I know I keep saying this, but... And just to um, kind of stir the pot a little bit, and also so we don't... Um, now we're thinking too much right now. You can ask, well, okay, you've been talking about unifeeler processes that can be represented by unifeeler hidden Markov models. What about the sort of general case? So hidden processes that can be, well, not represented by them, namely uh, non unifeeler uh, uh, hidden Markov models. So here's one example called a simple non unifeeler source. Um, and I'm going to draw the contrast as starkly as I can. The internal state dynamic is going to be a fair coin. Okay, so internal fair coin, we have two states, A and B. Again, if you forget the observed symbols here, it's just 50-50 on all the transitions. So all A, B sequences occur inside. But then I'm going to choose a certain kind of labeling of the edges for the measurement symbols this way. So uh, A goes to itself and B on a 1. That's where the non-unifilarity is, right? State, and I see a 1, suddenly it becomes ambiguous. I knew I was in state A, but now after I see a 1, I can be in either state A or B with equal probability. I, just lost, I, the observer, just lost information. However, if I'm in B and I see a zero, I know the process is in state A. Okay, so that's, that's a unifilar tra transition. The state transition leaving A are the non-unifilar non ones. So let's just imagine, I tell you, you just saw a sequence of, uh, you know, 20 ones. What internal state sequences could there be? 
Well, it turns out you can just sort of start enumerating these things. There are a huge number of them. In fact, you can ask how many sequences go to the all one sequence, and it's an infinite number. Right? So, so if I can produce all ones, well, I can just stay in A. Uh, or I can stay in A once and then go to B and stay in B. Stay in B twice, go down here twice, and so on. You can just kind of enumerate all these possibilities. It's a huge degeneracy now if you see all ones. You really don't know what's going on with the internal state sequence. Now, there's a question. We have this simple non uniform source, this process with this, this property generated by this, this particular hidden Markov model. Is there, even though this is non unifilar is there a unifilar presentation of this? And the answer is yes. I will show you. You will calculate this on your homeworks. There's a way, it's a different presentation. It actually has a countable uh, number of states. But when you write it down, there are a whole set of properties we can calculate that you can't calculate given this model, this presentation of it. Simple things like how random are the zeros and ones. Well, the Shannon entropy rate can't calculate with this, but you can with the unifilar presentation. And then again, just kind of visually to make this uh, <laughs> as stark as possible. <laughs> Fair coin, right? <laughs> All words of the same length have same probability. Oh, here, and this is the analytical version of that. Now, so this is the, over the AB sequences. Now, over this observe zero one sequences. I mean, you, you can't, obviously, how I label the edges, if you want, think of that as some measuring instrument on the internal transitions and states. It's a way I label that, way I'm measuring it, that leads to all this structure. No structure internally. All sequences occur. And here, things are being precluded. Zero, zero. Turns out that this looks a little bit like the golden mean um, in, in its support. But there's very complicated uh, uh, probability amplitude modulation here and so on. And everything kind of piles up down near um, seeing all ones, in fact. Okay, so this is just a very uh, kind of quick tour of how to think about the space of processes, trying to use these word distribution mosaics to give you some idea of the challenge we have when we try to go actually reverse the process and go from data back to it. Um, ultimately, and this should remind you of what we were doing with the dynamical systems, there's a classification of processes. So uh, this is a very popular activity in formal language theory to talk about how different, uh, how different machines can recognize different languages. The same thing here. We have a similar kind of hierarchy, which is exactly how the talk was organized. I mean, we have a sort of uniform processes, IAD process, R block, Markov, order R Markov, unifiler, and then non unifiler. So, and what I mean here is that every process that can be represented by an R block process can be represented by a Markov process and so on. Every unifilar process that can be represented as a non unifilar one. And then there are more processes that can be. All right, so, so these, are the, these are the examples we just went through, illustrating each of the categories. And just as a final slide, and I already kind of stepped into this, there are two ways to think about these models. So that's the last slide. Um, either we can think of them as generating sequences, and that was sort of the way I was talking about before, the simple non-unifilar source, non-unifilar source, it's a generator, and then I'm the observer, and I've seen ones, and now, that's sort of now what the internal state sequence is, is sort of ambiguous to me. So we can think of a process as uh, uh, being generated by a model, and when we do that, the edge label uh, we put the transition probability first and then the symbol you see afterwards. Just to kind of remind us that this, when I put this down, this is in generating mode. So it produces sequences, word distributions, and so on. Or in recognition mode, which is more the way um, finite state machines and automata models are used in, in formal language theory. And when we do that, we rev reverse the, uh, <clears throat> the labels on the edges. We have the observed symbol, what's being read in, and then the the transition probability. Now, what does recognition mean for uh, a binary sequence? Well, first of all, in formal language theory, it means that this machine will recognize a word uh, when 
the path that the word forces the machine to take has allowed transitions. You never run across a disallowed transition. Therefore, if I saw one zero, I could not see a zero. One zero zero would not be accepted by that model. Um, in addition, we're talking about word distributions. So not only are we recognizing which sequences occur, the subject of formal language theory, but their probability. And so we have in the back of our mind the probability of seeing one zero zero. Well, that's zero. Probability of one zero one. And we calculate that by multiplying together the transition probabilities as we get, follow a path. Okay. So the connection with with computer science is here. Not only do we think of these hidden Markov models as recognizing words like finite state machine does, but also representing the distribution with which they occur. And that can be, if we change the transition probabilities, it may not calculate the right word probability, and then we would say the word wasn't, the, the stochastic uh, language was not recognized by that machine. Or we use them as generators. Sort of like the way we're thinking about dynamical systems. They just behave, and we, we observe them. Okay, um, that's it. Like I said, the, the Z transform slides, you can ignore those for now unless you're interested in how to calculate um, the evolution of state distributions on these stochastic machines. Uh, we'll just do some simple examples by hand, rather than develop this contour integrals and all the technology behind that. Any questions? Puzzles? Yeah? In passing, you said that it was possible to create a unifeeler model for the non-unifeeler one that you presented. Right. And then subsequently you showed the hierarchy and right. the unifeeler was outside. So was that just a unique instance of one that could be done and not a suggestion of any kind of general or which would be in right. contradiction with the slide? Yeah, that's no, a good question. Yeah, so so that that the classification scheme here maybe should emphasize finitely represented. And so that's the out. For the simple non-unifeeler source, it turns out there is a unifeeler presentation of it, but it has an infinite number of states. And, and when we're doing these classifications, you have, you have to kind of be careful whether you allow infinity or not. So, th so these are all finite. These are, this is the space of processes that can be finitely represented. Well, in other words, with finite state in Markov models. Right, so in some sense, what I just said, if I allow this category to have an infinite number of states, and it turns out the SNS has a countable infinity of states, but there are other non unifeeler hidden Markov models that require, that have unifeeler presentations that have a continuum, Aleph 1 <laughs> set of states. So that, but we'll get there. I mean, I'm kind of jumping in. We don't really have the, the techniques um, and vocabulary yet to do that. But this will all become very clear. I hope very clear. OK. So again, if you have any questions on homework five slash midterm, just let us know. <laughs>